When you're doing your electrical testing, it's sometimes easy to get confused whether you need a high reading or a low reading. Let's have a quick look at that. So if we're doing our testing to see if we need supplementary bonding, you want low resistance between the exposed and extraneous conductive parts. When we're doing our main protective bonding test, or R2 measurements, we want low readings as well. CPCs, you want low resistance, so you get good automatic disconnection of supply. R2 measurements on main bonding conductors and such, you want low measurements. We want a high resistance if you want to prove that something is not an extraneous conductive part. We want to know that there's no connection to earth. So we want a high resistance reading between that part and the MET. I'll quickly go through extraneous and exposed conductive parts. I have got a video on this which I'll link to. But an extraneous conductive part is a conductive part liable to introduce a potential, generally earth potential, and it doesn't form part of the electrical installation. Actually gas pipes, your water pipes, steelwork and such. And an exposed conductive part is a conductive piece of equipment which can be touched and which is not normally live but can become live under full conditions. That's all your electrical things, your light switches, your boilers, your immersion heater, anything connected to the supply. I'm using the example of a towel rail here because that could be an exposed conductive part. It could be just a purely electric towel rail connected to the supply, 230 volt supply. Or it could be connected to the wet system, the central heating. Then it could be an extraneous conductive part. Or it could be dual fuel, electric and wet and it could be an exposed or an extraneous conductive part or it could just be a metal towel rail on the wall it's not connected to the supply not connected to any pipe work it is purely just a piece of metal so we need to be able to prove if that towel rail if we think it's just a piece of metal on the wall that it can't introduce a potential it's quite easy to see if it's an exposed conductive part there's any power going to it it's a little bit more tricky to know if it's an extraneous conductive part and there's a test that we can do to find that out. But why do we need to know? We need to know because we're trying to stop a potential difference. For current to flow, you need two points at different potentials. In these examples here, we've got two conductive parts that could be extraneous or exposed. The first example is no fault, but there's no equipotential zone. That means all the pipe work, all the metal work, everything is not connected together. There's no fault, so there's no risk hazard. In the second picture, you can see one of the conductive parts has got a fault on it. It's at 230 volts, while the other conductive part is at zero volts. There's no fault on that part. Therefore, we've got two points at different potentials. In that situation, current will start flowing. And if you're in between them, it's going to flow through you. The current is going to flow and try and get back to earth. And if you've got a good connection to earth on a piece of metalwork, that current is going to flow through you and down that piece of metalwork. In the third picture, we don't have a fault, but we have an equipotential zone created now. We've connected the pipework together. And no fault again. No current's going to flow because we haven't got a fault. But this time, because we have an equipotential zone, equal potential, equipotential, they've got to be at the same potential because they're connected together. One can't rise to a different potential than the other because of this copper connection between them, usually your bonding conductors. And if we do get a fault appearing on a conductive part, because they're connected together, that fault will also appear on the other conductive part. It sounds a bit odd, connecting everything together to become live, but that actually makes the installation safer because the two points are at the same potential. They're both at 230 volts. And don't forget that this fault should disappear very, very quickly. This is where we have our automatic disconnection of supply. The protective device will operate and trip this fault in 0 0.1 of a second or less is what we're aiming for. So we need to know in our installations what's exposed, what's extraneous. And we also need to know if it's not extraneous because it's also potentially dangerous to connect something to the earthing system if it doesn't need to be. You, you could be actually introducing a shock risk. As you can see here, we've got a person touching a piece of metal. An extraneous conductive part, or is it? And nearby, there is an extraneous conductive part. It's got good connection to the ground. It's introducing an earth potential. If for some reason the extraneous conductive part became live and we connected it to that piece of metal, that piece of metal will then become live as well. 
Was there any need to connect that piece of metal to the extraneous conductive part? As you can see, if that connection wasn't there, that piece of metal wouldn't rise to a potential, wouldn't become live. And you will be in contact with the ground in some way, shape or form. And voltage current might start to flow through you, depending what your contact to the ground is. So you've got to be careful that you don't just bond everything in sight, any piece of metal work, because it might not need to be bonded. If it's just a piece of metal sitting there, can't introduce a potential, leave it alone, because bonding it could actually, under full conditions, make that piece of metal come live. So to test and make sure that something is not an extraneous conductive part, we need to get our multifunction tester or such, and test between that part and the main earthing terminal. Now these can be quite a long distance apart. The wonder lead or the long lead, R2 lead, whatever you call it, is useful for this. Don't forget to know the leads out. So we connect one end to the MET, and then with the low ohm setting, we test to the piece of metal to see if it's extraneous or not. You can use the low ohm setting, or you could use the insulation resistance setting only if your meter doesn't have the resolution that you need. Most modern meters now have a, a known resolution of, well mine has a resolution of 99.9 .9 kilo ohms. A few years back you didn't have that so you had to use the insulation resistance setting. So we test between the MET and the piece of metal we want to test and we get a reading. We have a formula that tells us what values to expect. This is a formula here, RCP has to be greater than UO over IB minus ZT. Now RCP, that's the resistance between the part and the MET. UO is the voltage to earth. IB is the value of current which should not be exceeded passing through the body. And ZT is the impedance of the human body which is generally considered to be around about a thousand ohms. The value of current which should not pass through the body, well we don't want any current at all really do we? We're used to 30 milliamp RCDs, so we could use 30 milliamps as our current which should not pass through the body, and that will give us a reading of 6.7 kilo ohms between the MET and the piece of metal that we want to test. 30 milliamps is still quite a lot of current, and that can still put you in some danger. And if you're in a bathroom, you're a lot more vulnerable, you're wet, you've often got no clothes on, bare feet on the floor, you're, you're a lot more vulnerable to electric shock. And so it's often considered that the 30 milliamp current is a bit too high. And the recommendation is to measure to 10 milliamps or even 5 milliamps. The 10 milliamps will give you a reading of 22 kilo ohms, and 5 milliamps will give you a reading of 46,000 ohms. So that's the resistance between the part and the MET. So it's up to you as a designer to choose what you want to use as your IB. The recommendation is at least 10 milliamps, so you'd be using 22 kilo ohms. And if your readings are higher than these values here, that piece of metal can be considered not to be an extraneous conductive part. It is just a piece of metal. It doesn't need a bonding connection. So if your value is higher than 22,000 ohms, it's just considered a piece of metal. It is not an extraneous conductive part. It is not going to bring an earth potential into the building. And that's provided that automatic disconnection of the supply to the relevant circuit occurs within 300 milliseconds. But if the value is lower than what you're choosing, that piece of metal does have to be connected. That piece of metal will need main protective bonding. Let's just go through that again. I'm taking this directly from Guidance Notes 8, Earthing and Bonding. So it can be seen that if the designer elects to accept 30 milliamps as a safe level and the resistance of the extraneous conductive part to the MET, RCP, is above the threshold of 6.7 kilo ohms, then the conductive part need not be considered to be an extraneous conductive part provided that automatic disconnection of the supply to the relevant circuit occurs within 300 milliseconds. And it goes on to say that the definition of an extraneous conductive part does not include conductive parts that form part of the electrical installation. They'll be exposed conductive parts, won't they? So there you go. That's how you test 
to see if something is an extraneous conductive part or not. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. Um, I'll try and do a, a live video on this so you can actually see the actual testing procedure. Okay, thanks now.